Hey folks, so today I'm going to be doing a video on evaluation in chess. Uh, I think this is understandably one of the most uh, important aspects of the game. Uh, being able to properly assess a position and figure out what's important. Uh, this is something that chess players use to really aid in uh, their decision making and figuring out what to play. Uh, in fact, almost every decision we make on a chessboard is probably going to have some mix of calculation and uh, evaluation. Uh, if you're able to calculate three, four moves ahead, you still have to choose between different situations and different positions, and understanding the different factors uh, of the position that we need to evaluate, I think this is probably integral to the uh, entire process. So first, I want to talk about what I consider are the key factors of evaluation. Uh, in the meantime, I've put up a position that you can look at. Uh, it's currently white to move, and it comes from a pretty well-known game between Paul Karras and Edward Winner. And I think it's a really nice example of, of uh, some topics that we'll be discussing later on in this video. So in my view, the four key factors of evaluation are king safety, piece activity, pawn structure, and material. Uh, now these are a little bit broad. You may have heard uh, similar factors of evaluation from, from other places. Sometimes there's five, sometimes there's six. But I feel like these four really sum up uh, pretty much everything that we're going to be uh, needing to assess uh, over the chessboard. So let's just get into it. Uh, number one is king safety. And I think this one is uh, clearly the most important one because if someone is getting checkmated on a chessboard, then nothing else really matters. It doesn't matter who's ahead in material, the pawn structure, or anything like that. So if someone is getting mated, that's the end of the game, and that has to be uh, first and foremost seen as the most important thing. But the thing is, is that it's rarely clear that someone is actually getting mated in a position. Uh, for example, if you just take the situation on the board here, it's clear that white's king is a lot safer than black's king on e8, but how much safer exactly is still very, very difficult to determine. Now, looking at uh, the rest of the situation on the board, we can immediately think about another very important factor, and that is, of course, uh, material. Having extra material is uh, pretty much never a disadvantage. It's almost always a pretty serious advantage, in fact. And uh, I would say that this is one of the things that is maybe the most overvalued uh, even today in, in today's uh, chess society. Uh, many players at the club level or around there uh, often see material as, let's say, somewhat separate from the rest of these factors, and they don't view material as something that should be evaluated alongside with whatever else is happening on the board. Things like the king getting attacked, the pieces being active, or perhaps the pawn structure uh, being uh, wretched. Uh, in this situation here, black is a few pawns ahead, which is quite important. Uh, because, well, if we one day see a situation where some of White's pieces have been traded off, then these extra pawns will really start to, uh, to tell. So, king sa safety is definitely, I would say, the main factor to first consider when looking at any position, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Usually, if one side has a weaker king, they might have something to compensate for it, and that's what you have to kind of evaluate during uh, the game. So next up is peace activity. Now this is a pretty broad label because peace activity uh, in my view refers to not just pieces that are active and creating threats and uh, being dangerous to the opponent's position, um, but we can also just think about this as uh, the quality of our pieces, whether our pieces are well placed. Typically a centralized knight is going to be better than a knight on the rim. Uh, a bishop on an open diagonal is often going to be much better than a bishop on, on a diagonal that's blocked by pawns. Uh, and so evaluating the, the quality of your pieces is of course uh, an extremely important thing uh, in any position. And uh, this, I would say, is rarely can be evaluated on its own because a lot of times understanding whether your pieces are, are strong and have potential or not really depends on the pawn structure, which of course brings us to the, let's say, the final factor of our evaluation, perhaps the, the least important one compared to everything else, but still very, very crucial. Uh, and that's the structure. A lot of times when material is equal, when both kings are safe and uh, neither side has particularly active pieces, well, the thing that ends up deciding the day is actually the pawn structure on the board. Uh, it's definitely a problem to have weak pawns because then your opponent's pieces will be able to attack them quickly and pick them up. And conversely, if you have nice pieces, a lot of times it may simply be because they have targets. 
uh, any rook can look like a genius if all of the enemy pawns uh, are doubled. Um, so a lot of times whether or not you have a good bishop, for example, really depends on where your opponent places uh, their pawns. So the pawn structure is something that is, of course, very, very important to evaluate. Uh, certainly not easy to evaluate this one because there is simply so much uh, variety. Um, but of course, there are a lot of great examples out there and a lot of uh, very straightforward way to simply systematically learn about different pawn structures and middle games uh, and so on. And later on in this video, I'll of course be giving my recommendations for how to improve your overall evaluation skill uh, in general. So before we discuss what Karis played in this position, I first want to go back through the game and just show how this position actually arose, because I think that's the most uh, interesting part of the, of the game. So this game started with e4, c5. We had a Sicilian, uh, knight f3, knight f6. This is a pretty rare line in the Sicilian. You don't see this one uh, too much nowadays, but this was back in uh, 1935. So at the time, uh, I believe this was still being played. Uh, so Karis pushes e5. This is the kind of the critical continuation, knight to d5, and now plays this move, knight to c3. Uh, and already, I think this is actually a very interesting moment. Um, this move, knight c3, is currently considered uh, quite good by today's standards of theory. Back then, I'm sure it was also uh, considered a pretty decent move. And we see this type of move in other openings as well. The uh, main line of the Petrov these days comes to mind, where white is simply inviting black to take on c3, after which white is going to be willingly uh, doubling the pawns with the move d takes c3. Uh, I think b takes c3 is also possible here, kind of capturing towards the center. But the idea for white usually in this kind of exchange uh, is to simply open up the dark square bishop and get the development going. So already this is a nice example of a, a trade-off where white is, we can say, kind of damaging his pawn structure by doubling the pawns or, or being willing to double the pawns. But on the other hand, improving the power of his bishop. And, and so this is, uh, I think, already a very simple but very useful example of how uh, strong chess players are often having to evaluate these trade-offs during the game and uh, well one of the things that makes someone good at evaluating positions and good at assessing positions is being able to understand when it's worth it to let's say weaken your pawn structure for some other kind of advantage in this case doubling the pawns in order to improve the the power of the bishop uh, in fact, I would say um, that double pawns are typically uh, undervalued in, in today's uh, chess society. Uh, I feel like a lot of players uh, often view uh, double pawns as uh, being a much serious weakness than they really are, and they actually fail to to see some of the importance uh, that double pawns can can play in, uh, in a position. Uh, this is kind of a tangent that, that I think an entire other video can be made about the topic of double pawns and how they <laughs> can actually have some some secret benefits. But uh, okay, we'll we'll definitely get into that later. Uh, so instead, black actually played the move e6, which is interesting because black is, rather than taking on c3, actually invites white to capture on d5 and uh, double black's uh, d pawns here. Um, but I would say this is kind of a temporary doubling because black's next move is going to be d6, and it seems like black is going to be able to immediately trade off one of uh, their double pawns here. Um, so white plays d4, fighting for the center. Black played d6. Uh, and here Karis goes bishop to g5. And now White's idea is pretty simple. He's developing the bishop with tempo and uh, attacking Black's queen. Uh, if Black plays bishop to e7 here, then we can already see by the structure that this kind of favors White, uh, a trade of the dark squared bishops, uh, and Black will be left with some, some dark squared weaknesses. So instead, Winner plays a, a pretty critical move, and he goes queen a5 check. And uh, I think this is a, a decent idea. Uh, and definitely ask white a question, whether white wants to retreat with bishop to d2, whether white wants to play queen d2, uh, or simply block with the pawn with, with c3. So if white takes the tempo with bishop to d2, well then the queen will bounce back, let's say, to b6 and remain active. And now white's bishop on d2 definitely isn't uh, the most active piece uh, in the world. So kind of uh, misplacing white's bishop for the moment. Instead, Karis played c3. And uh, of course, he was uh, an attacking player, so I'm pretty sure the move queen d2 uh, was not really strongly considered by him at all. Um, but after c3, black goes c takes d4. And now would be an interesting moment to pause the video, think about this position, and try to figure out what you, sh what you would play uh, as white here. Okay, so if you want more time, obviously you can keep the video paused. Uh, it definitely feels like a critical moment because it, it seems like white has so many options. 
Um, I would imagine most of you guys probably focused uh, around a couple of moves, uh, mainly queen takes d4, knight takes d4, uh, and perhaps e takes d6, as this is also a capture and forcing move and should definitely uh, be considered. And uh, I think all of these moves are, are perfectly reasonable, um, but Karis's choice in the game, I think, is uh, not necessarily the best move in the position, but a very, very interesting choice uh, that I think can can really uh, be, be learned from. Um, well, let's take a look at a couple of these moves. Uh, knight takes d4 definitely feels like the most natural move in the position, just taking the pawn with the knight and, and keeping the knight in, in, in the center. Um, but the problem is after d takes e5, black is going to be able to take this pawn with tempo, and there's nothing so immediate that, that white can, can really do here. For example, we can consider the move like knight b3 hitting the queen. Black will play queen to c7. And, um, well, white can win back the pawn on d5. Black will start getting some pieces out, let's say bishop to e6. And uh, I think black's position here is actually uh, quite solid. Material is equal, and black is going to be able to develop uh, their pieces uh, very, very quickly here. Um, so I think things would be around equal in that situation, and it feels, let's say, dynamically equal as well. Like, neither side was going to be able to have more threats in that position. Uh, queen takes d4 is also possible, developing the queen, but this one feels uh, a little bit unlikely just because of the move knight to c6, and uh, we typically don't want to allow our opponents to develop with tempo. It's not always bad, but if we have other options, then usually there's uh, not much use in, in giving our opponents these kinds of moves uh, for free. Um, so Karis's choice was actually really interesting. I would say e takes d6 probably doesn't cause a whole lot of problems because this allows black to recapture with the bishop, thus developing his piece and allowing black uh, you know, the opportunity to castle on the next move. Okay, so what did Karis actually do? Well, he decides not to capture anything, and he just plays the move bishop to d3, which maybe some of you guys considered, and if so, I think good job, because it means that you have uh, kind of a natural intuition for attacking play, and uh, especially for uh, for developing with, um, uh, with the initiative. Um, because this move simply develops the bishop, it gives white uh, the chance to castle next, and is simply forgetting about uh, the material for, for a moment. Black took a pawn on d4, and white doesn't even recapture, uh, just wants to get the pieces out. And so this, I would say, is uh, really instructive and uh, another great example of the, the trade-off. Um, trading one advantage for for a potential disadvantage here white is getting the pieces out very quickly getting a lead in development better piece activity um, but on the other hand has to sacrifice some material for it in this case a couple of pawns um, which is definitely a significant investment a, a lot of games are won and lost because one side had an extra pawn in, in, in a position and so this is definitely not uh, not a, a small amount of material to give up um, but I think strong players have, have learned to understand that there are many situations where giving up this material, even if you don't see exactly how you're going to get it back, will pay off in the long run because your your peace activity will make up for it. And this is, I think, one of the, the main points I wanted to make in this video, uh, especially when it comes to material sacrifice. I think this is one of the most difficult situations that players have uh, evaluating. Um, when it comes to material sacrifice, a lot of times it's just about understanding the trend of the position. Uh, seeing that you're going to have active pieces, you might not be able to calculate from the get-go exactly how your initiative is going to break through, but if you trust your evaluation, then your peace activity should eventually pay off. Chess is kind of a, a logical game where if you have kind of an overwhelming lead in development, usually things uh, pay off more often than, than they don't. Um, so now black simply decided to take on c3 and, uh, well, continue grabbing material um, because if if he's going to be um, suffering this position, then he might as well grab some material so he doesn't uh, suffer for free. Um, here, Kara's castle just continues uh, developing, just completely forgetting about the queen side. And uh, black here, I think, somewhat naively just continues capturing pawns with, with C takes B2. Uh, nowadays, I think you wouldn't really see this at, at the top level. Players have learned typically not to be greedy, even if they don't see exactly how they're going to get killed. 
Um, we've seen enough of these games to understand at this point that the side that typically spends too many tempi in the opening grabbing pawns a lot of times gets punished with direct uh, tactical play and, and I think this game is, is no exception. So at this point I think Black definitely should have uh, started focusing on the development, played something like Knight to C6 and uh, after for example Rook to E1 I think White has a great initiative here definitely enough compensation for the material and uh, well the game would continue uh, along uh, sharp lines maybe something like bishop to e6 and now i think white can finally recapture b take c3 not so much to gain back the pawn but rather to be able to activate the other rook with rook to b1 next and for the moment it feels very difficult for black to play this position because the king uh, of course cannot castle queenside and if the king wants to castle kingside and then all of these positions black will have to play bishop to e7 which will allow white to take on e7, and then it'll be re uh, a little bit awkward to, to recapture on, on e7 there. Um, so I think white, uh, despite being down one pawn in this position, has more than enough compensation. The, the peace activity, I think, definitely uh, uh, is, is more important here. Uh, well, all right, black uh, took the pawn on b2, and it is understandable because he is at least taking the pawn with tempo. So a lot of times when you capture a pawn, you're not taking it with tempo, and it gives your opponent a move to do anything they, they want in terms of the attack. But here, at least, he is gaining a tempo on the rook, and so it's not like he's just giving white a free move to play rook e1. Um, so white goes rook to b1, but the issue is that the rook is now simply closer to the action, and now white only has to make one move, rook takes b2, and then the rook will be ready to join the attack, and we'll actually see that in, in some variations. Um, okay, so here black played d takes e5. I think this move is, is pretty understandable because black is uh, desperately just trying to develop here, and bishop e7 doesn't really seem playable after bishop takes e7, king takes e7, and e takes d6. Here, black's king safety starts to become a bigger and bigger factor, and uh, it seems like the king is just going to be in, a hu in huge trouble. And black has a very difficult choice here. Either allow the d6 pawn uh, to stay on the board or capture it, but risk uh, having the king just wide open in the center. Uh, so black decides to take on e5, knight takes e5, and then plays the move bishop to d6. Again, very logical, developing the bishop finally and developing with tempo hoping for white to play a move like rook e1 so that black could potentially castle and get the king out of the center. So here we finally have our, our critical moment. Um, once again, if you guys wanted more time to think about this position, feel free to pause the video at any moment and, and, and continue thinking. Um, and I think now would be a good time to discuss the difference between uh, dynamic and uh, static advantage. Um, so when we've talked about the four factors here, we, we've make, kind of made reference to how you can be better in terms of the pawn structure, you can be better in terms of peace activity, king safety, and of course material. If you have extra material, you're typically going to be better on, on this front. Um, but some of these advantages are static, meaning they're here to stay, they're kind of long term, they're not going to change very quickly. And other factors tend to be more dynamic. They can change very, very quickly, even in the matter of one to two moves. So when it comes to king safety, this can kind of depend. Um, there are many cases where if you simply give your opponent one or two free moves, well then they'll be able to castle, they'll be able to get their king out of safety, and your advantage will kind of disappear. Uh, the same thing can be said about peace activity in many cases. You might have active pieces for the moment, but if we give black some time to simply get the knight out, get the bishop out, and so on, then in terms of peace activity, white's advantage will not be clear uh, at all. Um, so these are examples of, let's say, uh, dynamic advantages, and I think it's important to understand this because if you realize that your advantage is dynamic, then that immediately tells you that you need to play for the initiative, you need to play sharp moves, you need to try to create an attack, you need to create threats in the position. I think a lot of players, of course, understand this intuitively, um, but I think it's nice to understand it uh, consciously because during the game, being able to, again, properly assess these factors is a lot of times what can give you the hint in terms of what you need to do, what you should be playing for uh, in the position. So when you have a dynamic advantage, you really, really need to be trying to play as sharp as possible and looking for those uh, forcing moves, immediate uh, knockout moves, sacrificing moves, any moves that generate threats. Conversely, uh, when it comes to things like the pawn structure, a lot of times if you have an advantage in the structure, this is going to be kind of a long-term advantage. Your opponent's pawns are going to be weak for many, many moves. 
And in this case, you really don't have to rush to try and, and convert your advantage. You can really take your time, improve all of your pieces slowly. Of course, there's a lot of material uh, on this subject. And uh, the important thing there to understand is when you have a static advantage, you're in no rush to win the game. In fact, you'd prefer if things were as calm as possible, so you could gradually improve your position and gradually increase your advantage until your opponent simply can't defend uh, anymore. Um, okay, back to the position at hand. Here, like I mentioned, white's advantage is dynamic, which means if we don't strike in, in the next uh, couple of moves, uh, the advantage might simply dissipate. Meanwhile, our opponent will be up two pawns, and this is going to be a very long-term advantage. So Karis here decides to strike uh, with the really fantastic shot, knight takes f7. Uh, hopefully by this point, a lot of you guys have at least considered the move. Uh, maybe you realized how strong it was. Maybe you, you weren't unsure about the evaluation can look unclear um, but indeed this move is, is absolutely crushing and uh, just generates this very very powerful attack where it brings black's king out into the open and the rest of white's pieces are able to uh, to checkmate um, so again i would consider this kind of sacrifice as a trade-off here white is giving up a lot of material i mean a full knight um, just to expose the king and bring the king out into the open uh, thereby making black's king safety a huge huge issue um, but at this point, I should really stress that it's no longer about evaluation. It's really all about uh, calculation. Um, being able to figure out whether the move knight takes f7 works uh, strictly depends on your ability to just calculate the lines. Can you find a forced way to, to win material? Now, you might be able to simply intuitively judge that the sacrifice is, is good, and a lot of players uh, do that, and, and they can be successful with that. Um, but typically it's not going to be as reliable as concrete calculation. My personal view on this topic is that you should use your intuition to guide your thinking, to guide your calculation, but then you should buckle up and actually sit down and do the work and calculate the lines, meaning calculate knight f7, king f7, figure out your next move from there, think about how black is going to respond, and make sure that the sacrifice you're making is, is actually sound. Um, so let's go through some of the lines. I should note, by the way, the move rookie one was actually also good in the position black and castle. Uh, but in this case, castling doesn't fully solve the, the problem of black's king because white's pieces are still so active that there is a lot of uh, danger for black on the king side here. And actually, the move knight takes f7 is even working uh, in this position, with the key point being that after rook takes f7, uh, rook e8 check. If black goes rook to uh, f8, then white will go queen h5. This is kind of the key move in the variation, uh, threatening uh, queen takes h7 and bishop takes h7. Uh, and if h6, simply bishop takes h6 and, and black's king is just getting mated here. Uh, and if bishop f8, then simply rook takes c8 and white has won back a lot of material. And now white's peace activity simply dominates the game. Uh, so I just wanted to point out that in fact, rook e1 was still fast enough, but not actually as strong as knight takes f7. This move is uh, an absolute knockout. Uh, so black play king takes f7, queen h5 check. Now black has a couple of options in the game. Uh, black chose g6, uh, which allows bishop takes g6 check, and this was uh, simply winning for white. Um, had black chose a different move, for example, king to f8, um, here I think the attack could continue in a couple of ways, but to me the most straightforward is to simply try to get the pieces involved as quickly as possible. When your advantage is that your opponent's king is super weak, of course, this is one of the most important things to always be thinking about, is simply how to get your pieces in as quickly as you can. Uh, so here rook e1 threatens uh, rook e8 checkmate, and after something like bishop d7, for example, white can go rook to e3, again along the theme of activating the pieces, uh, followed by rook f3, and this is simply devastating. Um, now, evaluating attacking positions, I think, is, is one of the hardest things to do in chess. Uh, again, an entire series can, can be made about this and, and has been. Uh, the one thing I'll say here about evaluating attacking positions is uh, one of the most important things to consider is simply uh, the power of the, the forces. How many pieces do you have in the attack? How many pieces is your opponent really defending with that are actually around the king? And whose pieces are actually going to be uh, more effective? If you can just try to evaluate those uh, 
facets of the position, or at least the, try to judge uh, the, the trend of the position. Are you going to be able to get your pieces into the game uh, quickly enough? This is, I think, the main thing to consider when trying to really figure out, okay, is this sacrifice is going to work? Because, of course, we're often simply not able to calculate everything out into the end. At a certain point, we have to make that intuitive judgment. So, to me, it's almost like a, a little sandwich. You start with uh, an intuition about what to do in the position. You do your calculation to figure out, okay, what are actually the best moves? And then at a certain point, you have to cut your calculation off. You simply don't have forever, and you have to make some kind of intuitive evaluation to figure out whether that position is going to be favorable for you or not. So kind of intuition, calculation, and intuition there. So going back uh, to the game, um, Black played the move uh, g6. This allows bishop takes g6 check, and after hg, queen takes h8. Uh, the material has, uh, the material balance, I should say, has definitely shifted. Now white has, uh, a rook for a couple of minor pieces and some pawns. So, material wise, black is still doing quite well, but if we look at the quality of material, it's very clear that, uh, white's pieces here are doing much better. Black's rook is stuck on e8. Uh, white's rook is immediately ready to join the action. The bishop, the queen are all, uh, nicely coordinated. And of course, Black's king here is kind of left defenseless, and, and so this position is just totally winning for white. Uh, I do like how Kara's finished off the game, so I'll just show the, the last couple of moves. Bishop f5 was played, uh, rook e1, bishop e4. So Black is des desperately just trying to create some cover for the king. Uh, and here White just finds another nice sacrifice, rook takes e4. Uh, very, very simple. This one is simply a matter of calculation. Uh, after rook takes e4, um, the bishop, of course, is taken off the board, but so is the protection of the g6 pawn, and this basically allows white to immediately uh, destroy uh, black's king. So d takes e4, queen f6 check, and here black basically resigned because he's going to be losing uh, this pawn with check, he's going to be losing the bishop as well, and uh, once that happens... Uh, well, actually, white will be doing fine in terms of the material, but of course, in terms of everything else, black will be completely lost. King safety, peace activity, uh, and so on. Uh, not to mention that white is also going to have these uh, amazing uh, pass pawns uh, <laughs> in the in the position. Uh, so I really like this example because it just it shows a very uh, fantastic. Um, idea of how you can simply give up some pawns in the opening as long as you develop your pieces and then look for active threats. Of course, this isn't always going to work out in the attacker's favor. A lot of times the defender is able to simply collect the material, say thank you very much, and uh, goes on to, to win in the end game. But of course, this is what makes chess dynamic and interesting, is that these situations are never easy to evaluate, and it's up to you and your experience to judge uh, whether or not um, well, the, the game is going in the direction that, that you like. So now I want to talk a little bit about how to actually improve your evaluation skill. Um, because I think the, the concepts that I covered in this video are pretty easy to grasp, you know, that you have to evaluate these factors uh, side by side. Um, but of course, this is easier said than, than done. During the game, again, it, it's not easy to weigh all of these factors, especially with the, the ticking clock. Um, so, in general, evaluation, I think, does improve with, let's say, general experience. If you play a lot of chess, if you analyze games, uh, if you watch videos, if you look through uh, annotated games, if you watch commentary, uh, as long as you're doing something chess-related, you're, you're going to be interacting uh, with, with various, uh, you know, instructive resources, and over time, you'll build up some experience, and your ability to evaluate positions will, will definitely improve. Simply, the more chess you see, the more chess you understand. Um, but of course, again, as always, there are very specific ways, uh, in my opinion, that you can really improve this part of your game. Um, one of the most important things, I think, would be to improve your uh, strategic understanding, um, your understanding of, let's say, positional chess, uh, piece play, uh, pawn play, prophylaxis, and, and things like that. Getting better at understanding some of the most common uh, positional elements in chess, uh, I think this is what will help you make a lot of strategic decisions during the game that are really going to be based on your evaluation. So things like changes in the pawn structure, whether they're favorable for you or not, uh, evaluating peace trades and, and things of, of that nature. Uh, there are definitely a lot of great books on, on this topic. Uh, I have a few that I would recommend. I'll uh, make a little bit of a list uh, in the description below. Uh, I have a couple here I would uh, present. Number one, The Positional Chess Handbook by Israel Gelfer. I think this is uh, one of the books that 
really uh, shaped a lot of my uh, fundamental chess knowledge. Uh, it's really a great book about, I would say, positional uh, decision making. And uh, I think uh, a lot of my chess understanding was based on uh, the examples uh, in the book. A second book uh, that's I would probably less well known is called uh, this one, A Contemporary Approach to the Middle Game by Alexei Sweden. Uh, Sweden was a Soviet uh, master, maybe grandmaster, who was a uh, um, very, very good player and an excellent author. And this is a, a pretty small book, but I thought it was very, very interesting in how it talked about the difference between strategy and tactics and how strategy and tactics uh, inter interlate with each other, as well as the uh, dynamic and static factors uh, that I was uh, mentioning uh, earlier uh, in the video. Uh, and lastly, I think definitely a classic and one that I would recommend for, for all players uh, the classic book by Jeremy Selman, How to Reassess Your Chess. Uh, the fourth edition is this uh, kind of mammoth of a book. It's very big and hefty, but <laughs> it does have a, a nice feel to it. Um, this is a great book because it really talks a lot about a lot of the uh, imbalances that I mentioned uh, in today's video. So things like the, the pawn structure, imbalances in terms of, of the pieces and piece play, king safety, and so on. Uh, if you want like a, a really, really in-depth guide as to how to understand these various imbalances, I think Silman is a great author and he, he uses a lot of uh, really, really great uh, examples. Um, so those would be the, the main books that I would recommend. Uh, if I think of a few more, I'll, I'll let you guys know uh, in the description. And uh, I would say the, the second thing that can really improve your ability to evaluate is uh, to study annotated games uh, of, uh, of a great player. Uh, this is something I've mentioned before uh, in previous videos. Uh, if you if you want my list of, of players that I think you should study, I think I covered that in a previous video in the series, so I'll just link to that in the description below as well. Uh, but basically, I think studying annotated games can really help in this regard, because if you play through 100 games of, of some great player, you'll really get a feeling for how they see chess, how they approach the game, how they evaluate certain positions, and, and how they handle these typical trade-offs that, that we saw in, in the game today. Things like uh, giving up your pawn structure for peace activity or vice versa. Uh, how to attack the king and, and judge uh, different attacks, uh, and just evaluating different scenarios that, that of course, uh, we all have to deal with uh, over the chessboard. Uh, I mean, studying annotated games, I think, is, is beneficial for a lot of reasons, but in my view, this is, I think, one of the, the most important reasons to actually study the games of a great player, because this is what really gives you that key insight into how a strong player really understands the game and, and how they handle these various uh, decisions. Because the decisions we, we have to make are, are typically very similar to one another, it's just that the concrete details in the position are different and, and how you handle that uh, is really is really up to you and, and your understanding uh, of chess. With that, I'll be wrapping up the video here. Um, hopefully my explanation of, of how I evaluate chess positions uh, made sense to you guys. If you have any uh, questions or comments, please uh, do let me know in, in the comment section below, and uh, I'll be seeing you guys in future videos. Take care.